Hi guys, g'day. I'm doing something a bit different today. I'm not reviewing a specific boot, but I thought I'd take a customer's point of view of what I see as the differences between Parker's brand and Grant Stone. For what I want to bring you about the two companies, this is going to be a longer video than usual. But of course, there will be boots in this video, lots of them. So what I'm doing today is taking a look at Parker's brand and Grant Stone from a customer's perspective. In doing so, I have intentionally not approached either company to ask their opinions or to seek insider information about their companies. So my personal opinion in this video is gained from buying and wearing their boots and on what I, as a consumer, uh, can see and hear about them on the web and on social media. To help me, I reached out to my fellow enthusiasts on Facebook's Parker's Enthusiast Group and Grant Stone Enthusiast Group. I will include some of your opinions in this, basically my op-ed piece to camera. So I tossed a coin and Parkhurst was the first cab off the rank. So let's take a look at all my Parkhurst boots uh, that I have so far. <laughs> um, let me start, I'll, I'll take them in the order that I bought them. Let me start with the um, Parkhurst Richmond boot in Ray's Reverse Waxy Mohawk. This is a uh, Mohawk leather from Charles F. Stead Tannery in the old Parkhurst 18 last, which is a slightly more almond-shaped uh, toe last. Uh, it's in a lovely waxed uh, rough out with the inside of the actual Mohawk leather uh, on the inside. It's on a Richmond pattern with the cap toe, and it's on a Ridgeway sole. The second boot I bought was an Allen boot, a plain toe boot, uh, in this case in green, or what's called spruce kudu. This is uh, Parkhurst's plain toe design, uh, and you'll see as we go along that although there are similarities, there are also differences. Um, it's on a day-night sole. It has an antique uh, wheeled raised uh, welt, uh, two-piece backstay. The third boot I bought, I went off script, and I got a a uh, brogue wingtip boot in natural chrome XL. This is called the Spalding. Day-night sole, uh, and clearly it's sort of a country boot, but done in a very casual chrome XL uh, uppers. Uh, eyelets and speed hooks, and a single piece backstay. Then I came along and saw these. These are factory seconds. This is the Allen boot pattern, and as you can see, there are similarities in the plain uh, boot style. Um, but this is where the, they start to diverge from time to time. You can see in the Spruce Kudu, it's a two-piece backstay, and this is a single-piece backstay. At about the same time, I, can, I was kind of bullied on Facebook into buying these. The Color 8 Dublin. Oh, did I say this is a dark rose Dublin leather from Halloween? This is also from Halloween. Uh, it's the Color 8 Dublin using the same dyeing processes as they do for their um, Colorate Shell Cordovan. Beautiful leather, this Dublin leather. It just creases really nicely. Um, it gives you that rugged look. But at the same time, if you keep it nicely polished in this dark burgundy color, um, you can wear it quite dressy. Day night sole again. Uh, and again, you can see that characteristic wheeled welt. Then comes a slight diversion. This is about where uh, Parkhurst hit their COVID restrictions in terms of their supply chain. Uh, and this came out after quite a long wait for different boots to arrive. This is back to the Richmond pattern, the uh, cap toe. And uh, it's in a Seidel leather uh, called Light Natural Tan. It's got differences again. We're back to that single piece backstay. Uh, the stitching on the toe is two stitches across and in this Richmond it was a three stitching uh, uh, toe cap with a two plus one sort of pattern. Again you'll see that characteristic wheel welt, uh, brass eyelets, no speed hooks, single piece backs there. At about the same time that was released another Richmond was released and this is called the Gaucho Moose in moose or Scandinavian elk leather. Lovely, almost um, 
a new bucky kind of feel to it. Again, all eyelets, two piece backstay again, and again, a, uh, a three stitch pattern with a two plus one on it. It's on a commander sole from It's Hide in the UK. And then my latest Parkhurst boot is this gorgeous animal. It's in uh, Seidel's Natural Veg Retan. So it's a vegetable tan leather, quite dry to the touch. And I haven't had this long, um, but you can see that it's creased quite nicely. The patina is developing really beautifully. It's on a uh, Ridgeway sole, which is also made by Day Night, but in this wavy sort of luggy pattern. Now, we've had a look at boots. Let's talk about Parkhurst as a company. Parkhurst started in 2018, founded by uh, former stock analyst Andrew Subisco, apparently with two clear missions in his mind. The first, scratch an itch that he had himself. In a world of expensive, not so great shoes that all look the same, how do you find a quality boot at the right price? So he decided to make a product that would stand out at a reasonable cost. His second mission, I think, was to make his boots in the US because, as he says in an interview with Stitchdown, the American shoe industry is dying. He saw how the loss of factories and jobs could really rock a community, and he was seeing the loss of generations of experience in the bootmaking industry. So his decision was to source as many components from US producers as possible, and where this was not possible because perhaps of a better product, like say, uh, Charles Stead suede or leathers, uh, he made sure that he partnered with, with uh, local reps of those products so that he kept as much of his supply chain benefiting American businesses. I haven't seen him mention it in interviews, but I suspect Andrew also is aware of the carbon footprint of his products. Uh, for example, the factory he contracts with is only 40 minutes away from him. Uh, the boxes that he ships in a well-designed but very frugal box that acts as both shipping box and boot box. These seem to be acts of think global, act local. When he started, rather than buying a last, as many small manufacturers do, he designed his own last and created his own boot designs to make sure that his boots were different from the mass producers out there. There's quite a lot in boot design that often we don't notice. For example, take his Richmond boot. Just a simple capto boot, you say. Yes, but he changes the pattern so that um, the back stay, for example, switches from a two-piece to a um, uh, one-piece. The cap toe may have a double stitching uh, and others uh, a triple stitch. Small little changes that create interest and diversity. Parkhurst used to produce four boot designs. The Allen Plain Toe Service Boot, the Richmond Cap Toe Boot, uh, the Delaware Brogue Cap Toe Boot, which I don't have, and the Spalding uh, Brogue Wingtip. He also produced the Bidwell Derby Shoe. When I first became aware of Parkhurst, the production of the Spalding, uh, I understand to be a particularly difficult operation, uh, that was seizing and I bought one of the last pairs. There were also only a few Delawares left, Brogue Cap Toes, uh, but I missed out on them. Covid affected Parkhurst quite badly. As a small batch manufacturer who cannot afford to buy big stocks of hides to make a lot of boots and inventory, Parkhurst has always focused on making small batches of pretty unique leathers. But even so, their website was pretty full of different makeups that changed around frequently. When the effects of the pandemic really hit in late 2020, Parkhurst's supply chain was severely affected. Due to supply and labour delays with people under lockdown or off sick, Park has found it very difficult to source components to arrive on time, and several of his US suppliers were shutting down either temporarily or permanently. For most of 21 and early 2022, this resulted in very few makeups appearing in inventory for sale. Andrew makes sure he keeps in touch with his followers, and his recent announcements uh, give us some scope for optimism. He has had to find different sources and factories, and while still remaining a small batch manufacturer, he will continue to carry inventory as the supply chain pressures ease up. While the ability to ensure that US manufacture is retained through a new partnership with another American factory, this second phase of development will see a more global and hopefully more consistent component supply chain. Andrew anticipates the new production launch to take place in late Northern Hemisphere summer. So that's the Parkhurst story. Now let's take a look at Grant Stone. These are my Grant Stone boots. Again, the operative phase is so far, because I do have my eye on a few more. 
So this is the uh, Diesel Boot by uh, Grant Stone. It's their version of the Plain Toe Service Boot. This is the Diesel in Saddle Tan Veg from Badalassi Carlo, Tanni, Italy. Uh, it's tan as if it were saddle leather, and it's, it's a tough leather, it patinas beautifully, came originally orange out of the box, but gradually with wear and patina has got to this uh, lovely sort of tan colour. Uh, then I bought through eBay, this is an eBay purchase, the Edward boot in tobacco wax suede. Uh, this is another wax suede from uh, Charles F. Stead in England. Uh, like all of uh, Grant Stone's boots, they're fully lined. It comes in the proprietary day-night studded sole, proprietary look-alike day-night uh, studded sole. As you can see, it's uh, patinaing quite nicely. All my Grant Stone boots, and indeed all my Parkers, are in size 8. Uh, the Grant Stone's in 8D. This was a 7.5E, because um, through reading the Grant Stone website, which is why I grabbed this when they came up on eBay, you can go a half size down and one width up and still end up with relatively the same size. My next purchase was another diesel boot, Planto Capto. Uh, as you can see, characteristic hardware from uh, Grant Stone. On a leather sole, uh, quite controversial to some people, I love the uh, leather sole. Black Chrome XL, uh, tough little boot. As this wears, it will t core There will be a brown uh, uh, background that starts to come to the surface. And then came, oh, this little beauty here. It's a rough, outdoorsy, go and kick something boot on a commando sole. Again, proprietary commando sole by Grant Stone. It's in a, a wax suede that they call Earth, again from Charles Estet Tannery. So you can see that where the, the rough leathers start to come from. A, a mock toe with uh, high walls, but a strange mock toe in that. The mock stitching is actually inboard, it's not at the edge. And it's got this little uh, toe puff before you actually get to the, to the mock toe. Sturdy little boot, I've taken it uh, on a lot of hikes. And then I bought this boot, another diesel boot. You can see where I'm going, what my favourites are in, in Grant Stone. Uh, this one is in Tan Essex from uh, Horween. Uh, Essex is the base tannage for um, Dublin leather that comes from Horween. So, this is developed first and then more oils and waxes uh, put in to develop the Dublin leather. You can see that all the hardware on Grant Stone is really the same. Uh, it's on their studded day-night like sole. This is a beautiful leather that ages really nicely. Because of the uh, lining, it, it doesn't crease as much as, as um, veg tan leathers generally do. But it will do, it'll patina quite nicely. Uh, and then, of course, there is the Diesel Coffee Suede, which is another Charles F. Stead suede in uh, a dark coffee-coloured brown. Uh, this one's on a Vibram uh, Cavity Wedge sole. This is one of the most comfortable boots I've got. Really lovely. Looking at the company, Grant Stone started in 2016 and was founded by Wyatt Gilmore and Josh Lang. Wyatt's family had a long-term relationship with a shoemaking factory in the Chinese resort city of Xiamen. His father had worked for Alden for 15 years, where he made contact with the owners of this factory, and then spent another 25 years as agent for the factory, liaising with other American shoe and boot companies who were using their manufacturing services. White himself worked for eight years in that factory, after a young career racing motocross. After an injury, his father suggested that he go uh, to work in the factory for a few months, just to experience a bit of the world. He stayed for eight years. He really got into making Goodyear welted shoes and stayed for eight years, learning the trade of a shoe manufacturer. The idea for Grant Stone was actually started by Wyatt's father and the factory owner, the name being that of a legendary Alden salesman. But Wyatt revived the idea in 2016, seeing the opportunity to make Goodyear welted shoes and boots using premium components and selling direct to consumer. The concept, as their website says, is to use leathers and components from boutique producers worldwide and create non-disposable footwear that fits properly, leading to the principle for their customers of buying better and acquiring less, while always supporting craftsmanship. Putting it in a nutshell, what drives them? Quality product from quality components, handcrafted by skilled and experienced craftspeople, durable products reducing waste, focusing on fit and sizing for comfort. 
It's interesting. Wyatt is quoted as saying that the price point was not the driving force. He basically decided to spec a shoe that was well made and whatever the price landed at would be the price. When they first started, they designed their own last, the Leo last, uh, and made a long wing and a plain toe derby shoe. Today, they make seven different models of boots. The diesel boot, uh, the Edward boot, the brass mock toe boot, the Ottawa Norwegian split toe boot, the cap toe boot called, funnily enough, the cap toe boot, a chucker boot called the chucker boot, and the Chelsea boot, again, just called the Chelsea boot. They also make an amazing six more models of shoes, a plain toe derby or blucher, a long wing, an Oxford cap toe, a wingtip Oxford shoe, a penny loafer, and a tassel loafer. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Mixing up different components like different welts, different soles, uh, different uppers and other limited edition makeups, they actually currently list 96 different models on their website. And they are not a made-to-order boot company. These are mostly in stock in the Michigan warehouse at any one time. All this sounds like Grandstone are a huge company, but actually, up until his father passed away recently, it's five people. Wyatt and Josh, Parker who looks after order fulfillment, Wyatt's wife who is the company accountant, uh, and his father until his passing. I'll put a link in the description below of an article on the uh, Stitch Down website about how the business of Grantstone is run. The obvious clear difference between the two companies is that Parkhurst is made in the US and try to maintain a US supply chain, even though this is likely to be diluted in its phase two development. Grantstone boots are made in China using US and European components. So how does made in USA versus made in China play out, at least to a non-American? Well, these are my thoughts, and my opinion comes from the viewpoint of being an Australian uh, looking at made in USA and made in China. Here are the things people think about when they think about manufacturing overseas. Number one, quality. Number two, loss of jobs in the local economy. Three, ethical concerns, particularly over sweatshops. Four, politics. Let's take them each in turn. First, quality. Quality is not a function of geography. Quality is a function of the specs a factory is asked to meet, process control, and the available skill and experience. Wyatt himself has said that if he wanted to make a $159 shoe, this factory could do it. But he chose to spec his designs with quality components and then let the price fall as it may. In most cases, you can go anywhere in the world and spec a product with quality components and a high QC measure, and you get a good product because the factory has to produce what you want at the quality standard that you set, or they won't have your business. Second, the local economy. Now, loss of jobs at home is a bad thing. I get that. Australia has also gone through this. Economics today, though, is based on a global economy. Business is about efficiency. So a good business will seek efficiency wherever that is. In the 1900s, that's what made one company move from one small town in Virginia to another small town in Oregon. The availability of cheap land, cheap workers, and lower taxes. It's just become globalized now. But you still don't necessarily lose out. Your companies are still American or British or Australian companies, and they will employ people at home, just not so many and probably not doing the same things. And they will pay home country taxes, Guess where those taxes go? If your government has it right, hopefully to developing future industries and future jobs. And here's where lost jobs are such a tragedy. As Western governments embrace the global economy for reasons of politics and influence or for other economic reasons, why didn't they foresee this and develop training pathways and reskilling policies for their citizens? Singapore, a planned economy that is not communist, recognized in the 1960s where the world economy was going and moved its citizens from an entrepot trading nation to electronics, international banking and other new industries so that by the 1980s it was and remains an economic giant. Third, ethical concerns. Yeah, sweatshops exist, but once a country develops economically, their cost of living increases and the country's economy must move on. On top of that, the development of ethical concerns in multinational companies due to protests and concerns at home means that they now ensure, in fact, they audit the working conditions of the factories that they contract. 
I think you'll find that most countries, with some notable exceptions, no longer have sweatshop labour. Finally, politics. I can't say much about that. If you won't buy Made in China because of politics, and nothing that I've just said will sway you, well, you do have a point about the autocratic, opaque government. So if you feel strongly, then don't buy Made in China. What about Made in USA? you gather from my comments that I won't not buy Made in China if the company has the right foundations like Grantstone seems to do. At the same time, not being American, I won't simply buy Parkhurst just because they're made in the USA. If I thought that way, well, I'd just buy Australian RM Williams. No, I buy both because I like the motives and quality-driven philosophies of both companies. While it's not relevant to me that Parkhurst is made in the US, I must say the driven passion of the brand to react to how unemployment can destroy communities resonates with me. The uh, passion to keep the generations of experience in one industry going, the drive to change the American shoe industry by providing a quality product made in America with new designs and thinking. These qualities apply to me as a vision, not as an American. Ultimately, I buy both Bradstone and Parkhurst because I like the beauty of their designs and the quality of their product, not because of where they're made. However, if a Gradstone was a faceless conglomerate making shoes in faceless human factories, if a Parkhurst was based on a lie and was unethical uh, in the way it treated suppliers and customers, I would drop both in a flash. Their vision, as seen in their design, manufacture and marketing, first attracts me to them. Their quality product keeps me interested. Now let's look at how their styles are reflected in customers' views. This is where I got a lot of my uh, great opinion from my Facebook uh, boot friends, members of both the Parkhurst and the Gradstone groups. Most of us are agreed their signature design may both be quite simple plain toe service boots, but their execution is what's different. Parkhurst will generally give a rugged heritage feel in their leather selection, their welt design and the overall construction. You can class their look as fashion rugged. Grand Stone, on the other hand, is more sleek and sophisticated with cleaner stitching, uh, cleaner welt cuts and lining. They produce more of a classic boot, although the introduction of a brass boot gives them some claim to ruggedness and workwear fashion. Don't get me wrong, both are made tough. But the choice of leathers and the makeup design makes Parkhurst look great for the yard, Gradstone for the urban jungle. There are some exceptions. I have taken Gradstone's brass boot in earth through some really challenging terrain and it's performed like any tough boot you'd like to mention. Parkhurst's uh, Color 8 options look so elegant you just want to baby them. But still, despite the variety in each brand, People seem to equate Parkhurst with a Pacific Northwest vibe and Grandstone with a more corporate feel. So they look at Parkhurst when they consider Truman, say, and they look at Grandstone when they're also looking at, for example, Aldens. Some say Parkhurst, due to their choice of different and unique leathers, shows more character. They have charisma. Whereas Grandstone has loads more choice in leathers and is much more versatile to wear, you can wear them with any outfit style from rugged casual to business casual, and if you stretch it a bit, some models with a suit. Now, in terms of overall construction, I find their lasts, the Gradstone Leo and the Parker 602, are perfect for my feet. Both are snug at the heel uh, and open out at the ball of the feet, gives your uh, toes room to wiggle with no pinching or squeeziness. Parkhurst has slightly less volume uh, if you have a high instep, but not by much. Both sets of uppers are from famous and well-established tanneries. Uh, Gradstone feature leathers from Horween, Charles F. State and Badalassi Carlo. Top tanneries producing a lot of hides for top names. Park has feature also Charles F. Stead, Horween, Seidel, another famous American tannery. Their leather selection tends towards the exotic, uh, like netty tans and uh, kudu, moose, double shot. Uh, what's been described to me as Beefy Chrome Excel, that double shot. <laughs> Both use quality American leather for their welts and their mid and insole construction. Grandstone will play with flat welts and clean split reverse welts to uh, preserve elegance and sleekness. 
Parker sticks with a wheeled a split reverse well that is generally antique so it looks rugged. Grandstone controls their supply by sourcing their proprietary versions of a, a Daynight lug like studded outsole and their version of the Commando lug sole. They feature a lot of leather sole models, again showing their sleek design. Their hardware is also similarly proprietary, generously sized and sturdy and backed. Parker is probably a function of their size, will source outsoles from famous brands, Dana, It's Hard, Ridgeway. No leather sole versions. Whoever heard of taking a leather sole boot up some Pacific Northwest trail, right? Parkhurst's hardware is less impressive, more normal, and they tend not to be, well, they're, they're not backed, they're just star-pressed. Quality control is great by both brands. They both seem to weed out factory seconds ruthlessly, and I have bought seconds from both, but I'll just talk about my experience of factory firsts here. I have never seen a stitch out of place on a Grantstone. In fact, they always display perfect stitch density and placing. Parkhurst stitching is also pretty good, although I think it's fair to say that befitting the rugged vibe, a little less precise. Clicking, or the choice of where the hide is cut when cutting the pattern, is better in Grant Stone. Uh, their uppers come to you like some upmarket brand, like you expect leathers from Alden or Ellen Edmonds or Loke. Parkhurst, again I guess befitting the more rugged leathers they use, may show some less perfect choices of where they cut or click. In the overall construction itself, both are good, but Grantstone does feel more premium. They are both undeniably quality goods. Their pricing between $300 and $400 are in that sweet spot once you pass the entry-level pricing of $200 Thursdays, and before you get to the $400, $550 made-to-order boots of Truman and Nix, and enter into that heady realm of whites and Viberg at twice the price. In value terms, when you look at the markets, that their styles aim for, they represent really good value for the mid $300 price. Parkhurst are definitely worth that price. Overall, I think Grandstone is better value for money and arguably could be priced mid 400s if not for that made in China tag. Honestly, I think if Grandstone had made in Boston or made in Melbourne or made in Northampton, stamped all over them, you'd get mid $400 for them. As for customer service, both companies impressive. Queries, complaints and returns are handled quickly and, in my opinion, well. I've heard some say that uh, Grandstone takes a long time to respond to inquiries, but I've never found that. I usually get a reply by the next day and, in general, the replies are thoughtful and helpful. I suppose you'd say that there's a less personal approach from Grandstone's team. They're not as active on social media, so they rarely grab and repost enthusiast posts on their own feed and I haven't seen them much reply to Facebook or Instagram posts. However, Wyatt is on the Stitch Down Discord and I have seen him reply uh, very personally, very frequently to all inquiries there. One of the comments from my Facebook enthusiast inquiry said that speaking with Andrew is one of the most pleasant customer experiences. Andrew seems to be more personally in touch with fans, remembering he is a one-man band. He responds to comments on Instagram and Facebook. He replies, very personal replies to email. As I said, Parkhurst is a one-man band. Apart from contracting uh, a factory to actually make his patterns, he does everything himself, from marketing to QC and even finishing off the boots in his basement. And perhaps this makes Parkhurst look a lot more engaging. So guys, there's my comparison of Parkhurst brand and Grant Stone. Tell me what you think. Put a comment down below. Look, at the end of the day, I love both. Both companies' lasts fit me really well, so much so I never have to break in their boots and I can wear them straight out of the box without feeling any pinching or pain. I certainly will keep buying them. Although, I think I may slow down buying Grant Stone at some stage, once I feel I've had enough of the variations sufficiently represented. Parkhurst? I'm always excited what new drops they'll announce because they'll always be different and quite exciting. Here's a thought. I wonder what if one day Parkhurst and Grantstone merged, offering two faces of boot design and character from one company. Hmm. <laughs> Alright guys, don't forget to click on like and if you haven't already, click on subscribe too. I'm going to keep bringing you loads more boot reviews and boot unboxing videos, so don't miss them. And if you like uh, this sort of longer format in-depth video, let me know that in the comments below and I'll make a few more. Until then, 
Take care, mates, and keep well.